based on uh, based on uh, any number of comorbidities, we can embolize the genicular artery, which goes to the synovium of the knee, and that reduces the inflammatory markers that uh, cause the inflammation and subsequent pain. So it's, uh, the studies are showing that it's, uh, we're getting about a 70% reduction in pain in these patients. And ideally, once that happens, we can get them tuned up to go to physical therapy, either lose weight or get off their anticoagulants or just give them a better quality of life. So it's a minimally invasive procedure to uh, treat that severe osteoarthritic pain. I don't have any slides on that one today, so I wanted to make sure I let you know about, about that as well. So prostate artery embolization. This is, I think this is one of the coolest things that we're doing now. Uh, and I'm probably, I think I'm the only one in Nevada doing them. And then the only one in Northern California in this area that's doing them in volume. Uh, so men, uh, the prostate just continues to grow in all of us. Uh, or we may lose our hair and uh, and grow it on our ears, but eventually the, the prostate is going to get symptomatic. And we score men on the International Prostate Symptom Score, uh, any men with symptoms over a number of 20. So we're looking at nocturia, urgency, incomplete emptying, and... Uh, you, David, sit down here. And so anything over 20 is severe. And then we can uh, take them to prostate artery embolization. Usually we get an MRI beforehand just to make sure that there's nothing else going on there that, that is, hasn't been noticed before and to get a good size of the, the gland. And then we do an angiogram focused on the pelvis. We get into each prostate artery. So there's usually one on each side and deploy small particles into the prostate gland. And we, then once we do that, the prostate gland over time shrinks in size. And the way I, I tell patients is that we're just putting the prostate on the diet. So we're not necessarily killing the whole thing, but we're, uh, we're taking away its blood supply. So it's not going to grow anymore. And some of the cells are going to die and it's going to shrink down, but it does still get enough blood supply from the, either the adjacent rectum or the, the bladder to keep it alive. But it's, it's, uh, going to be significantly reduced. And usually by a month out, men are seeing some significant changes in their symptoms. And that's the way we usually follow them long term is at one, three, and six months, we do follow up clinic appointments and have them fill out that IPSS score sheet to gauge how they're doing. And I've had uh, multiple men recently where their scores are in the high 20s or 30s. And a month out, they're down into single digits. And they say it's just a life changer for them. And it's all done uh, same day, and they're out an, after, an hour after the procedure with just a little Band-Aid over their, uh, where we access at the femoral artery. Any questions about that? It would be good if you add uh, radiofrequency ablation and photodynamic therapy to the equation. Uh, we do our... Uh, in, we do RFA for, not for the prostate, but we can do RFA for any hepatic oncology. Is that what you mean? Yeah, but both, you know, radiofrequency ablation and, as, and also uh, uh, photodynamic therapy, where you inject the photosensitizers into the tumor and um, laser it, just in uh, adding more uh, killing tools in addition to um, arterial embolization. Yeah. Yeah, we, I don't do that. The um, that photo therapy that you were mentioned, I don't. I don't. Not sure about that. Is that something that IR has typically done? Yeah, you can inject the dye like uh, methylene blue or endocyanine green, and even low dose chemotherapy um, into the tumor. And then there's a fiber optic light. You can tether it through the cannula. Okay. And uh, we can work on this. I like to, uh, you know, reach out to you. Maybe me and Dr. William. And see how we can work together on this and add uh, things together. And I would and, definitely like to learn more about that. Yeah, but uh, your presentation seems like very excited, interesting. Yeah, and so uh, these pictures here are actually showing the the embolization procedure. So we're just in the left side of the pelvis. Uh, can you see my arrow? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the, is we have a microcatheter. So our axis is over on the right side. 
and we go up and then down the contralateral iliac arteries and eventually find the prostate artery. And those things can sometimes be pretty squirrely to find. They're very small. Uh, but we get a microcatheter into it. We confirm it with an angiogram by injecting contrast. And this is a really good half moon blush of the prostate. And then once we're there, we can put in the small particles. Because the biggest thing that we're really looking out for here is non-target embolization, meaning those particles go someplace we don't want them to go. And the worst place they can go is down into the penis and cause some skin ulcerations. And, uh, and the studies that have shown that when that has happened, it's usually been two or three weeks self-limited. It's not a good two or three weeks by any means, uh, but they get an ulcer, it heals up and, and then scabs over and then they get uh, good, uh, good coverage with skin again, but they're usually very small because these particles are really small and all it takes is one or two particles to get in a small capillary bed and it can shut that down. What are the but, particles made out of? For uh, resin, I, I don't know the particular kind of resin and based on the different manufacturers, it's all, we have, it's 300 to 500 micron spheres. So they all gauge them that way, but they all use some proprietary resin to do it. Are they radio, are they radio opaque? I mean, can you? No, uh, because when we mix them up, we mix them with contrast. Uh, so ISOVU 300 or 350. And when we're injecting, we aren't actually seeing the particles, we're seeing the contrast they're mixed in with. So mm -hmm. we, when we inject, we're looking for uh, stasis or really reduction in forward flow in the artery to know when it's time to stop and to make sure that we're not getting backflow out of the artery and then it's shooting down someplace we don't want it to go. What about prostate cancer? Patient has cancer. We can, uh, we'll do up to Gleason 6, so really, really small uh, and prostate cancer, but I've had a few patients recently where they've come in with some big changes in their symptoms. They didn't tell me that they had the symptom change uh, very quickly and over a matter of a month or so. And we got we get their PSA and then their MRI at the same time and their PSA is through the roof and they've got metastatic prostate cancer from where they didn't even know they had anything to begin with. So uh, it's just we found some some bad prostate cancers on on these patients, and once that happens, when we're, we'll send them over to urology for their their biopsies and eventual um, treatment if they can still have any. Do, do you see consistent changes in PSAs? So just say in the benign one, benign ones at all. Uh, you know, we tell patients or? don't get a PSA drawn within a week or two weeks after the procedure because it's going to go through. It's going to be enormous because we're mm -hmm. causing lots of local inflammation to that prostate, uh, which is another reason why we send send guys home with a tapering steroid pack, uh, just because they can sometimes have transient worsening of their symptoms after the embolization just because of just local inflammation. Mm -hmm. Uh, question in the chat was, um, is there any insurance coverage for this? Yeah, uh, every, all payers are taking, uh, are paying it. It's nice. Okay. Yeah. The, uh, the Janica artery embolization is about 50, 50 right now of whether the payer is going to cover it or not. Uh, mm -hmm. but we are really pushing for it and the UCLA is doing all the studies right now. And they're just constantly just pushing the payers to do it. And uh, we're about 50% hit rate on that. If, if it was uncovered, what, what, would the, what would a ballpark figure? We've had some men come from Canada. Uh, and the cash price, I think, in, in, our, in Reno is about 11000 And the hospital would probably be about a $60,000 cost. So... Okay. Um, all right. Before you, before you go ahead, but before you leave, I want to ask you some logistics about having your own radiology thing outpatient. Oh, no, I, I ask whenever I've got a, a, a bunch more. Okay. This, well, uh, so, iliac. So, yeah, go ahead. Go okay. ahead. I'll, we'll, we'll get it at the end. Okay. So another thing that we can offer, uh, not as, as fun as the prostate embolization is just reconstitution <clears throat> of people that have uh, whether it's an external compression or uh, DVT and thrombus within their venous systems of their uh, of their pelvis. Uh, so this 
uh, young woman had a May Therners, and that's just compression of the left common iliac vein from the overlying uh, common iliac artery. Uh, so what we can do is get it open and again with, uh, with a venogram, uh, make sure that there isn't thrombus in there. If there's thrombus, we can aspirate it and then stenting. Uh, and that, this is just a fancy picture of the IVUS. Uh, IVUS is an intravascular ultrasound, so it's a small ultrasound transducer on the end of one of our catheters. And so we can image the inside of arteries or veins to get sizing of it. And it's a pretty cool system to have. <coughs> uh, and it gives us some really good information so we can size stents and balloons correctly. So here's just the stenting of that iliac vein. And just and then she has improved flow going in. Uh, so now we're getting into the peripheral arterial disease and limb salvage. And what we saw in uh, throughout the country during COVID, that there was a pretty significant increase in amputations in patients that didn't have any prior endovascular evaluation or treatment. So what the things that I've heard in talking to other community docs is that if a patient has a wound and poor flow, their argument is why... Uh, why try to work on their flow now when I'm just going to be amputating in six months? So they're just going to amputating now, which I think is definitely the wrong way to go because mortality uh, and morbidity for these patients, is, especially if they're living in poor conditions, it's, it's almost a, a death sentence once they have a single toe amputated. Um, and a couple of our other CIC locations, because uh, we service a lot of the Indian health community in Northern Arizona is these patients are living 30 miles off the closest paved road. So they're very remote. And if they were getting amputations, it's they do very poorly from it. So uh, our goal is to save the toes and, uh, and the limbs because that saves the lives. Uh, this is the uh, 2013 showing incidence of uh, amputations. Reno had a yeah, Reno and Vegas, of course, uh, had it uh, are doing quite a number of amputations, bigger in uh, more populated cities, of course. But if you if they did this data now uh, from 2000, uh, 2020 to 2021, I'm sure it would be in more in the red in Reno because we've seen quite a bit more amputees. <coughs> Uh, very common things that we can do, whether it's you guys do in your office or we can just do in ours. And we try to make it as easy as possible to send us referrals. So if you think someone has an issue, just send them our way. We're not asking any of the referral uh, folks in town to, to do the complete workup for us. If, if you think there's an issue, just get it our way, then we'll, we can take it from there and we'll keep you informed of it. Uh, I give everybody my cell phones. So you can text and I'm uh, always letting letting uh, the referring docs know that what's going on with the patient just with a quick text after we work on someone in the clinic. Uh, so this is this is going into the RFA uh, and this is cryo for the kidneys. So if I can see it with ultrasound, then I can usually get a needle into it in our center. If I can't see with ultrasound, then I would just end up taking the patient to the hospital and just doing under CT guidance. Uh, and this, this is the fun stuff that not many people are doing in the outpatient world uh, in uh, throughout the country. Uh, so chemoembolization and Y90s. So catheter directed oncology. So we get a small catheter like we were doing in the prostate gland up to a tumor in the liver. And then we can deliver particles whether they're chemoembolization beads or particles that are covered with uh, EHM-90 and, and deliver it right to the tumor and kill it from the inside out. So this is just a, uh, a right hepatic arteriogram uh, for a Y90. You can tell it's been a Y90 because these coils right here, usually we coil the gastroduodenal artery prior to embolization and make sure that all the flow is going into the liver because we don't want any of those radiation particles going anywhere else because it's radiation particles. <laughs> you don't want them anywhere else. And usually follow them, uh, follow them up immediately after the Y90 delivery with a, a PET CT. 
and fibroid embolizations. So we're it, the fibroid embolization is uh, we've done a number of them in Reno. The patient population isn't that's great for fibroids, but still there's plenty of women that have them and just don't want to have that hysterectomy or myomectomy. And I actually just did a fibroid on a woman. She was in her late thirties. She definitely wanted to still have kids, but she had multiple fibroids and, uh, and symptomatic fibroids, pain, bleeding, the, uh, the, all the usual characters for it. And she, the offer from her oh, my gyn was just hysterectomy. So there's a hundred percent chance of not being able to get pregnant after that. And still uh, with a fibroid embolization, we may be able to maintain her fertility by getting those fibroids to shrink down. Uh, so it's a same day procedure. We usually hold on to those women for about four hours after because the biggest thing for fibroid embolization women is just post-op pain. Uh, so we're making sure that their pain is under control afterwards and then let them go home. We have a, a pretty uh, aggressive pain regimen for them to go home with, and that includes a fentanyl patch for three days. Uh, that's combined with uh, around-the-clock NSAID and some oral narcotics, but uh, it's what's usually what's needed to control the, the pain from, from these embolizations. And it, just like the prostate embolization, uh, except that these uterine arteries are much larger and way easier to get into, uh, we deploy the small particles into the uterine arteries and the fibroids preferentially pick up those particles because they just, they're like uh, vampires. They just, they, they grab all the blood supply from the uterine artery and take it in. Uh, so when we, when we deploy those particles, it's most of them go into the fibroids. What is the size of those particles? We start with 300 to 500 microns, so the same size as the, as the prostates. And usually, if we don't get some reduction in forward flow by after the first vial, then I'll increase it to 500 to 800. And depending on what it's looking like, then go even bigger. But generally, don't need to go any bigger than that. There's no side effects, like if it goes and enter into other uh, cardiac arteries or anything like that. That's, that's why we're always making sure that it's only going into the uterus and not anywhere else. If it's going somewhere else, we try to identify that source. And if we can, we'll just put a coil in that non-target source. And that they won't know any difference for that because... What, we're not embolizing end vessel, we're just embolizing a uh, more proximal vessel and then it can get blood flow from elsewhere. But generally for fibroids, we don't need to do that. I don't think I've ever had to coil a non-target vessel uh, because these, these uterine arteries are really robust and can get them to them pretty quickly and distally and get it all into the uterus. Doesn't it, doesn't it, um, don't they feed the, the uterus itself, not just the fibroid? That's correct. Uh, and so, it does, they do go into the uterus, but the uterus can handle quite an insult. Uh, but like I said, most of the particles are actually uh, taken up by the fibroids themselves. If you got a CT or MRI within a couple of days after a fibroid embolization, the uterus would uh, look really bizarre. So we tell him and try not to go and do that because uh, it will end up scaring the radiologist reading it if they don't know that they just had an embolization. Uh, but usually by a month or so out, the rest of the uterus recovers and looks normal again. And then the, the fibroids themselves shouldn't be taking up any contrast if they had a contrast CT. Have you ever had a case where the, the uterus ended up getting necrosed because of, you know, you, you, you embolize the blood supply? Is that is that, is that I, I had one that, that they, they, they did that. They, she was having a lot of pain. She went to the emergency room. This was a, many years ago in Sacramento. Uh, she went to the emergency room, got a CT scan. She didn't tell anybody she had this procedure done. And I think one of my partners read it overnight. And short of him saying, this looks really bizarre, they, they use all the key words that led the OB or a guy to go to a hysterectomy when she should have just waited out with pain control and it probably would have just been fine. 
you know, sometimes they have car payments to make too. So <laughs> yeah, which is why we don't get many referrals from guides because we're taking these procedures away from them for a non-surgical approach. You know, you don't know that I'm the hormone guy in town and uh, they don't like me either. So <laughs> I'm used to that. You know, Reno is a very unique market if you're new coming into town. Yeah, they all know me by now, though. I'm not that new. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I'm only I've only been there two years. And so I think they still think I'm new. And uh, some people aren't happy that we're offering different solutions. Uh, that's why we reached out to you. But, you know, you're, you're, well, thank you're, you. You're, you're, that's you're, why you're, I say I'm in good company. You're in rows. That's what you, we like. You'd fit right in with our group. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this just shows the decrease in size of the uterus and fibroids. Uh, it's probably about six months afterwards. We try not to image until three months after if we if we even need to. And uh, what we'll do with women, it's we follow up at one, one, three, and six months again, just usually with how are you doing and uh, a clinic follow up, but no, no imaging. Uh, and then we do, I do a host of other procedures from Paris, Thor's ports, lines, dialysis work, uh, anything else that you think of that you think. IR or image directed therapy could do something for, uh, you could always just text me and uh, we can talk about it because I bet you we can do something to help out. And that's all I got. Okay, anybody have, and there's a couple of questions in the chat. Thank you so much, that was uh, interesting. Can active liver <laughs> cancer going through chemo do the liver embolization? Yes, definitely. Uh, patients do uh, best when, when it's actually a combined multi-pronged approach to it. So if they're, they're getting their systemic chemo or any other uh, chemo, whether it's low dose, and then going in and treating with a chemoembolization, which is usually, uh, usually treat, it's called drug eluting beads. So it's small beads, about 100 microns in diameter, uh, and they've been soaked in adriamycin and of only 50 milligrams. So it's a super low dose of, of the adriamycin, but it's going directly into the tumor. Uh, so if they're doing another systemic sort of therapy, combining the two, I think is the, the best way to go. Uh, so often when chemo embolizations and, and Y90s were coming into favor, the oncologists were waiting until end stage where none of the, what they were doing was working anymore. And then the liver is just riddled with, with cancer. So us coming in, it's more of a, a salvage if we even decide it's, it's worthwhile to do. Uh, but the best way to go is do it when early on and hit it with everything you got to get it under control. Mm -hmm. well, well, I think this is, this is a good project. If we combine platelet nanoparticle loaded with ICG, which is endocyanine green and methylene blue and chemotherapy, it's a nanoparticle, and we know the plated nanoparticle do adhere to cancer and to um, bat pathogens. Um, and I think a combination of this with what you're doing at the same time, um, we can get even maximum results, especially after you do the embolization and you inject the plate this nanoparticle loaded with chemo and uh, photosensitizers, you can activate them. I think we have fiber optics that will go in the same um, uh, ca cannula that you're using or the fiber optics that you're using and they can tether throw it and you can shine the light into the area of the pathology, um, whether it's infrared and red light. So you can do photodynamic therapy at the same time you're doing the embolization and you're using contrast. Um, so we can use endocyanine green as a contrast. Thank so it you. works in both way as a photosensitizer and a contrast. Have you used ICG before in the cyanine in the state of whatever context that you're using? No. Is it a radiopaque contrast? Yes. In the cyanine green, it's a radiopaque contrast. Okay. But it has a double thing you can do. You can do it. You can use it for photodynamic to kill the pathology, whether it's benign or cancer or fibroid. At the, sa at the same time, you know, it's a contrast. So you, you, it's a dual, dual, dual rule here, 
And I, we, we can work, we can talk, because I want you to present on Monday, next Monday, where I have my presentation. Is that okay, Dr. Mm -hmm. Williams? I want you to present Dr. 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 Evans, not up to me. <laughs> I want to steal him right now. There's no question about it. I told uh, you, you can steal my speakers as long as you, you, you uh, allow me to, to steal yours back. That's all. <laughs> no, well, no, no problem. I, we can do the trading under the table. So, so <laughs> Dr. Evans, Dr. Dr. Halasa has a, a sister group uh, that they meet on Mondays. So. Okay. Yeah, um, if you uh, shoot me an when email. You're available. Yeah, shoot me an email or yeah. text me. I can give yeah, all. Yeah, um, I have number. my. Do you want you want to have my phone number right now so you can text me so I can ar ar arrange some meeting with you? Um, seven one three. I don't have a, a pen right now, but I've got my phone. Okay. Doctor Halas, okay. just put it in the chat and everybody can see it. So. Okay. okay, I'll put it in the chat right now. Yeah, we got a, another question. Is after after the shrinkage? Um, and I think it was the question was right after we were talking about the uh, the fibroids. Um, can they regrow? For fibroids, yeah, mm -hmm. they they can, uh, but it's not going to be for a very long time. Once we take get those, and because when we deliver the particles, it's going to even the small fibroids that are haven't grown to really show any image characteristics. So it's getting to all those cells throughout the uterus. So we're not only getting the really big ones, but we're getting the ones that haven't really developed into anything yet. Okay. Uh, what about the prostate? The prostate. So we've been embolizing organs all over the body for decades and decades, but it's only been in the last five to 10 years that we've been focused on prostate embolization. So the studies are showing five years out from when this was really started, that men are doing great from it. Uh, but it's not to say that in 10 years from now, uh, they establish some new angiogenesis and little mm -hmm little capillaries getting to it and feeding it and then it can grow again okay okay any can i ask you just a couple of general questions so before yeah. i came to came to reno i was in a big medical group and we were 52 doctors and we had uh, physical therapy and we had a lab and we had um x-rays and, and mris and ultrasounds i mean we had a whole, de whole department and around 2007 2008 maybe uh medicare changed all their rules and they cut the, the, the payments to the outpatient um, clinics by 70, 80%. And um, I, I don't remember all the details, but uh, we ended up selling to the hospital because the, ho the hospital group, the hospital group took our equipment, used the same equipment, and they, they got paid three, four, five times as much as, 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 as we did. You're, is that still hold or is that changed or? No, at the hospitals, so for these prostate embolizations or fibroids, our, our, our charge to the payers is about a quarter of what the hospital can get. Mm -hmm. uh, so the hospital contracts are significantly better uh, because they're just taking into account all the nonsense that goes on between the parking lot and the OR. Uh, so the insurance companies are having to pay for all the administrators in between. When you go into an outpatient setting, they're all, they're taking that into account that you don't have that kind of overhead. So the price is a lot less. So you have to just make sure that you you run lean and efficient. There's always room for improvement for that, but it's it's we're not offering CT or MR or X-ray like traditional right. X-rays. Mm -hmm. We have ultrasound there, and then our fluoroscopy. Uh, but in our center, it's a three-room OR, we're, and we're going to be dual credited as a surgery center and office-based lab. So it's just different sites of service uh, in terms of the game that CMS plays. Mm -hmm. And most of the, the work that I do is done in the OBL site of service, which is called Site of Service 11, and the ASC, which we should have our AC accreditation, hopefully within the next two months, but Nevada moves really, really slow. And uh, that site of service 23. Once we have that, we will have uh, pain docs. We have four plastic surgeons and uh, a podiatrist, a inter uh, interventional cardiologist, and hopefully soon a uh, total joint and another podiatrist. So they're all going to be operating in there. So it's just one way of uh, we can make sure that we're offering a great service, but keeping the lights on. Mm -hmm. uh, question about thyroid cancer, could you do anything with that? No, there's some people across the country, I'm not one of them, that is doing some sort of 
whether it's blood sampling from the thyroid veins, uh, or I don't, no one's doing any directed therapy into the thyroid. It's just the vasculature up there is so anomalous and uh, difficult that doing that sort of work and that it just takes a really, really long, long time to deal with that if you're doing vein sampling from a thyroid gland. Yeah, and it's not practical. The reason why- It's not practical. Like, if you have cancer in the thyroid, right, it's better to remove the whole thyroid because even if you embolize and you kill that tumor in the, in the cancer in the thyroid, the thyroid tissue is genetically, there are genetic errors and you will have another recurrence or you'd have another cancer will pop up. Yeah. So the most successful treatment for thyroid cancer, just remove the thyroid completely and use thyroxine and people are surviving it versus uh, removing just little pieces. I mean, same thing for breast cancer. I mean, you can do those things, but still you have the breast tissues are uh, prone to have cancer. Um, you know, so it's, it's things, if there is a reasonable way, if you just remove the whole tissue, it's good. If, if not, then yeah, you go with immobilization um, as, as a treatment. But the problem is that cancer, once it starts, um, all your tissues of the same kind has a risk of um, emerging and becoming cancer. Okay. Have you guys had experience of uh, or heard of IRs or some, some others doing catheter-directed treatments of the thyroid? I have not. So. Okay. Um, next question is how much, how, I guess, a cash price liver embolization out of, how much is liver embolization out of pocket? It's a, for a chemo embolization, it's probably going to be, when you use those embolization CPT codes, it's usually about the same. Uh, so probably 11 to 12,000. I, I don't know for sure, but I think that's the ballpark. Y90 is a different story because the Y90 dose uh, comes from Canada, and it's that is uh, very expensive and out of our hands. And that dose is about a sixteen thousand dollar cost all by itself. So, can, can, you have to be a radiologist. Can you be a family physician, pain doctor, and getting certificate of training by you, and build insurance, or you have to be a radiologist in order to you to do this? So, uh, to do to get a catheter in place, you, that's. Uh, you need to be IR for that, but there are, uh, if you can get uh, a, a nuclear, me if you have a nuclear medicine license and are certified in that, then you can actually come the day of uh, the procedure and deliver the dose through the catheter that I've put in place. And then you, that can be billed uh, separately and you can get a charge for that because there, when there's the Y90 there's multiple different codes that go along with this because of the uh, nuclear regulatory issues that go along with it and um, there's one rad onk in town that's wanting to do just that to get get credentials at the center so he can be part of just delivering it and we don't have an issue with that. So that you have to be a radiologist, even if you train, if we, if we develop a fellowship program, can we develop a fellowship program one to two years for other medical specialties and they can get a certificate and they can do it and practice it based on this fellowship certificate or, or you I, have to do it? I don't know about that. I would, I would hope so uh, for something like that because it just improves the, the uh, it <laughs> improves competition is good. And I think places like Reno need more competition because the 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 rest of the the club that's been there a long time doesn't like to have competition. So that in itself says we need more competition. Find out if this is possible so we can develop uh, um, intervention radiologist fellowship program integrative. You can call it integrative, and possibly we get doctors on the board be trained. Are you interested to train doctors? Yeah. I, I did go into private practice because at the time I wasn't in, interested in training, but it's the more I do it, the more interested I become. I think it would uh, kind of just sounds like the whole your whole setup is, is a rather expensive proposition. I mean, just, just to open the open the door there. Oh yeah, this it, our whole location is not inexpensive, and that's why we're. Uh, 
we it started at from a, an interventional radiologist in Arizona and to build multiple outpatient OBLs, and now they're all hybrid. And we're, we've got a, another one in construction in Roseville. We've got uh, Salt Lake City, Reno, multiple Arizona, New Mexico. Uh, so we're we're able we're getting some good uh, good motion to develop these in multiple locations. So, you know, so most of us are in, in a, a type of primary care. I mean, I, I mean, I am, but I don't consider myself that. So, what what would be sort of the high, what what to look for to, to to send to you for prostate issues? You know, just general uh, prostate enlargement um, symptoms or. Uh, yeah, you're you're spending some good quality time, or you and your staff are spending good quality time with your patients when they're in there with you. And patients start talking about all their different issues, whether it's part of what you're looking for at the time or not. So, uh, when if they are complaining that they're having to get up five plus times a night, or just a couple times a night, and wrecking their sleep or their wife's sleep or their significant others. Uh, because their prostate is getting big, then just letting them know that this is an option. You don't always have to go to urology and have a TERP and that medieval procedure. You can actually have something a little uh, more um, more directed and less invasive. So same thing for the fibroids and women with pelvic congestion syndrome. So often uh, women can go decades with bizarre deep pelvic pain that goes undiagnosed for a long time, and then they could get a hysterectomy and then they still have it. When uh, when you look on some cross-sectional imaging, they may have some deep pelvic pains, uh, veins, like a, a male with varicocele, uh, but men, you can see that, uh, those, that bag of worm of veins in the scrotum, but women get that in the pelvis. So something like that, just these uh, undiagnosed pelvic pain that it may be due to uh, a, just a venous insufficiency in the pelvic veins, and that's something easily treated. So it's just another another trick in your tool bag to mm -hmm. uh, think about and to send them our way. And whether it's a, a women with pelvic floor, they're, they've been told they've got pelvic floor uh, issues or something with the uterus, or they just, they don't know, then we can often go back and look at previous imaging and see that they've had a lot of big veins in their pelvis coming off of the, uh, usually the left gonadal or left ovarian vein. And uh, then we can treat it and they can do really well. Same thing for the chicken artery embolization in patients with severe knee pain and you don't think they're ever gonna go to surgery or, or they just need another option just, that's true informed consent. Give them all the options that are out there and not just the surgical options. May I ask a question, please? Yes. A, pra a practical question. Uh, I've been doing the pain and the ultrasound since 96. So that's a little bit ahead of the game. But I was wondering with all the different things you do, what percentage of the things, what part of the things you do could be done with ultrasound without the uh, fluoroscopy? So any biopsies, drainages, many of the RFAs or cryos, whether it's uh, liver or renal, uh, could be done under ultrasound. We try to do as much as I can under ultrasound because I'd rather not have to use a CT scan, which means I have to go to the hospital with it. Great. So yeah, my just... information, I texted in my room. Is that info at CDPMCS? Yes, and then you have the phone number there as well. Right here. Okay. Right. Okay, got it. Right. So, Dr. Dr. Okay. Evans, what's your what's of all of this, all these things you mentioned? What's your favorite? Um, I really like doing the varicocele or the pelvic congestion syndrome embolization because I get to use a bunch of coils, which are always fun, and it's a relatively fast and painless procedure. The prostate. Embolization is painless on the patient, but can be very painful on me because it can take a long time. That was the next question is how long would that take? I mean, on average. Um, if you go, if you ask anybody at a teaching institution, they would say it's three to four hours. Usually when I'm doing it, it's about an hour, uh, but I also have the attention span of a hummingbird and uh, we, we try to go quick on those. I would say it's, it's probably very tedious you know, finding the art, the, uh, 
the veins and, and threading it, right? Yeah, finding that prostate artery, even if you can see it, can sometimes be really difficult because it is, it's almost just as big as our microcatheter, and our microcatheter is um, 0.2 inches in diameter, uh, mm -hmm. so it's, it's pretty small. Um, have you ever, I, I know these things happen, have you had where, where the, the veins tour? I haven't had any of that, and depending on where it happens, we we can just deal with it right there. If it's a vein, that's not a, that big of an issue. If it's artery, then that's a little bit bigger issue. Um, but if we're deep in the pelvis like that, uh, a small coil can just take care of that easy enough. We've done that thousands of times for trauma and patients do well for it. If it's in a bigger artery like an iliac, then we just end up uh, stenting it. And on absolute rare occasions, which has never happened to me, knock on wood, uh, then we just we have to temporize and then get get a patient to the hospital but almost is, like almost like getting into a locked car with a uh a, 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 a hanger yes yeah. <laughs> uh which is your least favorite technique uh the i think the of all of those, I like doing the prostates when they go well, and prostates that take a long time, those are also my least favorite. Uh, so then the next question is, that again, what you would consider a success rate, uh, um, which, which are the most successful uh, procedures, which are the ones that kind of are kind of iffy? The prostates are very successful when we are embolizing a prostate and a guy is calling us back two weeks later saying that he's sleeping through the night, can piss like he is 18 years old and his wife is happy with him again. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, I really like hearing that. You ever, is it at all common to have any, um, you know, anything can happen anytime, um, some sexual side effects, you know, post, you know, uh, negative set of side effects? That's the beauty of this one. We don't have the issues of retrograde ejaculation or, incontinence or impotence after like a TERP or Urolift, because even though a Urolift is kind of minimally invasive, they can still lead to retrograde ejaculation. Uh, most men have an issue with that. Uh, so it doesn't come with those sort of side effects. And the one of the goals of the prostate embolization, if they're on a Flomax or any of the other uh, BPH medications that can cause uh, some ED, that if we can embolize it, uh, and they get a good result, we get them off those medications and then they can regain or uh, get rid of that, those ED issues. Mm -hmm. okay. it, yeah, doesn't, it doesn't directly make the ED better, but it indirectly gets them off the medications that are making it a, a problem. Good. You do embolization of the tumor of the prostate, a benign or malignant. Do you, is there any incidents that they will have another recurrence? We're not. Uh, directly treating prostate cancer with embolization. There are some studies ongoing right now for Y90 delivery to that. Uh, it's something that would really have to show some positive results because of the risk of dropping some Y90, Y90 beads into the prostate would, it would be fairly scary delivery considering if one of those particles goes somewhere else, it could wreak havoc on the penis or the rectum. Uh, but right now, it's it's really only for uh, BPH, not for uh, prostate cancer. But we can do it on very low grade uh, in, in BPH with low grade cancers inside the prostate. Okay. Uh, okay, great. Anybody else have any comments or questions for Dr. Evans? Uh, You'll, you'll, uh, I, I have your um, contact information uh, if anybody needs it. Um, Do you uh, have my cell phone? I don't know. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll send it to the group right now. Okay. Yeah, that would be great. So. It's still Arizona area code. Mm -hmm. so. It's all right, mine's Pennsylvania, so. Okay, and it's probably been a while since he lived in Pennsylvania. <laughs> Uh, nine years, yeah. Yeah. Did I answer? Oh, did I answer that question? How much is a liver embolization out of pocket? Uh, I think I asked oh. it. I don't remember. Okay. Yeah, you did.
Okay. Okay. Um, you get out of state uh, referrals at all? Or, or you oh, have, yeah. Uh, we have been, we've had a, clinics around, a number right? from Utah, California, get a bunch from Vegas, uh, mostly prostate embolization from Vegas. Mm -hmm. And I think we've had a few from Idaho. Okay. Do you do your ablation at the same time, or you do it differently with the liver tumors, metastasis? Sorry, you I didn't get. I didn't get the first part of that question. I mean, when you do, let's say you have metastasis in the liver from colon cancer, and you want to do the embolization there, do you do a combination of radiofrequency ablation and embolization, or you just one, either one of them? No, it's it's one or the other. We can. <laughs> When we do chemoembolization, that can often wreak havoc on the arteries. So if you do that, you may not have a pathway to get a good Y90 delivery into it. So ideally, if you can, uh, and if they're a candidate, Y90 first, and then if you're concerned about radiation dose long-term, then we would switch to chemoembolization or drug eluting beads. Okay, gotcha. Okay. Anybody else have any comments or questions? Um, Dr. Evans, we're here every Tuesday at five o'clock. If there's a, we usually have an integrative uh, medical uh, conference, a webinar. Um, you're always welcome to it. I'll send you um, a link if you're, if you're interested, we'll put you on our, our uh, emailing list. Um, and uh, we, we would certainly invite you back again in the future. Uh, it was, I think it was very interesting. Like I said, most of our group you know we're not radiologists and it's like you said you know you guys are down in the basement uh you know doing those mysterious things that you do so yeah i'm trying to come up to the light and be a day walker yeah please please do all right <laughs> thanks thanks okay. for having me um you're more than more than welcome uh, it was great again any, anybody um have any comments or questions before we let this uh, young man uh thank go you on? very much i'll see you guys next week where uh, i'll be presenting uh prostate uh, treatment, uh, kind of an alternative prostate treatment modality. So, yes, that was ne that was this. Uh, my next thing was uh, Dr. Hartman. Our own Dr. Hartman is going to be presenting. I thought it was depression, but uh, that's fine. Uh, no, it's going to be my, it? my involvement in the prostate community trial. So using off-label medications to treat prostatomegaly and cancers. Okay, here we go. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so that's next week. Um, you know, again, everybody knows we're here, same time, same station. I keep pleading with you, bring one friend. We'll, we'll double our community. Um, we'll just a lot next week. And then have them have them bring one. So um, so so we can we can grow our group. Thank you, Dr. Evans. We're getting a lot of uh, uh, in the chats. Great talk. Thank you for being with us. Um, and uh, we're, we're we're happy to um, you know we're happy to to have you on with us. Um, and we'll we'll. Uh, I'll I'll arrange with your staff in a few months to maybe maybe uh, come back if we can have some other other information. Um, case histories maybe um, is is always interesting. Okay, um, you guys like doing a little case presentation? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And um, you'll uh, you'll probably be hearing from me in in not not too distant future also. So. All right. <laughs> All right. Okay. You, okay. Everybody have a good night. All right. So thank you so much. Um, and right. Again, you're more than welcome to join us anytime. Um, so um, and, and, and with that, um, uh, we're going to get done a little bit earlier than normal. But uh, if you missed it earlier and, and Dr. Cruz, you're, you're on. I don't know if you could could uh, open up. So I don't. So today, so Dr. Evans, you don't know that we're, we're the rogues of the AOA. We were decertified in the summertime because we, quote unquote, strayed from our mission of uh, rheumatology and autoimmunity. Um, that that was that was the excuse they used, um, and they used two of my lectures actually. By the way, in case you didn't know, was uh, anybody it was uh, my autism lecture and uh, my traumatic brain injury series. They they were quote unquote shocked that that would be presented at our our, our conferences. So um, so I. I, my, my reaction to that was if you don't know uh, what the autoimmune issues are with autism and traumatic brain injury, then maybe you should, uh, instead of shutting us down, maybe you should attend some of our, our, uh, our, our programs. So, so anyway, last week um, there was a, um, an OMED uh, 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 and subspecialty uh, meeting on a, on a Wednesday and, and they've invited me and 
I, I turned it on and I kind of just walked away and I forgot that my phone records it. And today I got a cease and desist letter from the uh, council of the AOA for uh, violating their, uh, their uh, you know, um, uh, their, their uh, and misconduct and violations of applicable, applicable law regarding my attendance at their recent meeting. So, um, so they demanded that I destroy the, the, the transcript, which I did. I mean, what the hell do I want their damn transcript for? And uh, so just to let you know, it's, it, it's, you know, it goes on and on. Um, so we have, we have reformed, if you're still listening, Dr. Evans, or those of you know, we have re regrouped as the American Osteopathic Society of Integrative Medicine. And um, we're, we're, we're at some point, we're planning to uh, apply as a, new, as, a, as a new subspecialty. I believe that uh, I am a, a lightning rod and, and uh, would be rejected out of hand. So we may need somebody else to, to do that kind of presentation. Um, uh, some of the things that we were accused of, and just, just to kind of give you the one, we didn't have a website. So your, your, your uh, video tonight will be on our website that doesn't exist. And, um, and uh, uh, straying from our, our mission and uh, uh, that, that was that was kind of it. I don't know. I don't really know what the what the real issue was, um, but um, they don't want us around. That's for sure. So, um, uh, so we don't need them. So um, we're we preliminarily actually um, uh, have a uh, 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 dates at, in South Lake Tahoe uh, in in January um, uh, January um, days um january uh 20th and 21st is a friday and a saturday and we can do sunday also if we want um at, i think it's at the hard rock in south lake tahoe we're, we're going to couple we're going to partner with the nevada osteopathic medical association um and remember we are still ama accredited we're just not aoa accredited so um, i like to wrap my head around that one still um and uh uh if uh, anybody's interested in, in, in presenting, please let me know. Um, and um, uh, we'll, uh, you know, we'll continue on and, uh, you know, do our thing, um, uh, you know, with, with, with or without the, the AOA's uh, blessing. Um, and, uh, and with that, anybody else, uh, Dr. Burgess, you have anything for us as usual? Everything's 100% beautiful. Okay. Are you going to Boston, by the way? I'll talk to you about that in the next few days. Okay. Okay. How about Dr. Cruz? Are you still on or is she going? Uh, no. No, I'm not going. Okay. All right. Any, any, um, any words of wisdom? So again, Dr. Cruz, of those of you who don't know, is also our resident uh, legal uh, scholar. Um, uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, she, she props me up when I get myself into trouble, which I seem to do with regularity. Um, and, and accidentally, automatically, it, seem, it seems at this point. So, <laughs> um, so um, uh, any, any words of wisdom? Uh, anybody, anybody in the group go into OMED? Uh, so uh, if you prefer an alternative, I will be presenting at AMMG, well, actually the day before on October 28th in Denver. Um, and I'll be, um, I'll be uh, doing uh, our everything you uh, everything nearly everything we learned about testosterone in medical school was wrong, so it was it was one of the lectures that would have been at OMED, but they don't want that. So, so we're, we're there. We go. <laughs> okay. I hope that was interesting. That was a little bit something different. Um, you know, we don't usually hear from the, um, uh, you know the radio you know the radiology people, and he's doing some interesting things. Um, I do have a couple of patients that that he's been that he's treated and they've done really well, um, you know, uh, for, with prostate issues, um, and uh, uh, they, they they said is it about in about three to four weeks they most of them tell me that they're about seventy five to eighty percent uh, you know symptoms are are are, are diminished so so um, with that anybody else have any any comments questions um, anybody have any anything to volunteer Dr Beamer you got anything for for our group. Well, I tell you what, um, I'll, I'll leave you tonight with two things I heard at the FLCC said I think you'll like. And one is a statement by Mark Twain, who says that the man trained to read who chooses not to read has no advantage over the man who, do who does not know how to read. That was one. The mm -hmm. other one was that all scientists agree when you censor those who don't agree. <laughs>
All right. Any anything you can share with us there? Any sort of tips or wisdom? Well, we learned a lot about autophagy. Uh, I, I tell you, the thing there that might be important for everybody to know is that uh, most of the people are not treating a lot of acute COVID anymore, uh, but there is a lot of lingering spike protein toxicity, and the pathologists uh, and probably the radiologists and people are finding us all throughout the body in many many tissues. So we thought maybe it was just going to certain tissues and things. But it really, over time, uh, is present and been found in virtually all tissues and glands and everything. And then they just kind of went through a laundry list of all the things that are happening. And, um, you know, there really isn't that much COVID going around right now. And, and the consensus seems to be the vaccine may more, be more the cause of it. Uh, and then we had a big presentation on the vaccine VAER, or VAERS system, the VAERS system and the data that's in there and uh, the veracity of all that data and all that stuff was discussed. But um, in terms of treatment of long COVID, the, uh, our groups, uh, I, I, I have to tell you, Dr. Clearfield, have been really up to date and have most of the current methods have been presented throughout uh, our, our time together. And uh, you know the FLCCC protocol really hasn't changed that much, uh, but we are also bringing to the table ivermectin, intranasal and also methylene blue, uh, which they're starting to catch on to. And there's a lot of interest in, but not much information as of yet. Um, mm -hmm. So autophagy though, and promotion of autophagy is the way you eliminate the spike protein from the body. And unfortunately there's not a drug really that you can give or anything. You can use resveratrol, you can use uh, spermidine. There's several things that are known to help promote autophagy. And then there's also several things that are known to be negative towards of it. Interestingly, hydroxychloroquine and pro proton pump inhibitors, uh, because they impair the body's ability to perform uh, the destruction uh, of, of those of those proteins. So that was another big subject. And believe it or not, the answer is low cost and wonderful. It's called intermittent fasting, and I know we've had presentations on that. So um, you know, at some point we uh, they, they've updated a little bit that uh, there's like this more complicated protocol what they now call intermittent fasting it's, it's it's a little bit i don't i won't call it dumbed down but they they know that it still works but they try to make it easier for people to do um and uh, still get results so there was some good information on that so a lot of good information to be had and most importantly there was 350 people there and they were really all proud to be there and uh so really supported the organization so i think they'll have further meetings okay um, i got a, a couple of uh uh, uh, I got a, a message from Dr. Uh, Evans again, forgot to mention for the ASC accreditation, they have to do 10 free cases. So if we have any patients that need ports or picks, um, they can place those at no cost for the next the two Thursdays. So, um, okay, anybody who's local here. Okay. Um, hey, Mike, can you pipe, pop up just one more time here? Um, hey. So, so, you know, I, I, I'm a simpleton and I, I'm not all that bright. What is the definition of autophagy? Well, what it really means is it, it is it's it, I, yeah, it is a little bit odd. What it basically boils down to is the process by which when it's triggered, um, your body, quote unquote, the way it was explained, was kind of takes out the trash of proteins that are inside the cell that aren't doing anything useful. So there's kind of a trash can of proteins that builds up in a cell. And, uh, uh, you know, when you trigger fasting, I guess it just causes the body to kind of go and review some of these intracellular components and police the uh, cytoplasm. Uh, I'm not certainly an expert in this area, uh, but it can either break down, it forms these, uh, uh, you know, vesicles that uh, have like acidic and caustic, you know, breakdown pro proteins, various kinds of enzymes that break down proteins. And also it's like acidic, you know, uh, and that's why the protein pump inhibitors and HCQ are, 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 are against autophagy because, you know, they uh, reduce the pH or alter the pH inside this pH dependent, um, you know, lysosomes or whatever they're, you know, you might call, there's various different structures that do it. But uh, essentially that's, that's how it works. So they, they kind of portrayed it as taking out the trash and uh, call, you know, the, uh, the trash doesn't get picked up when uh, the kitchen's cooking up full speed. So you got to settle things down, uh, let the metabolic processes slow, 
and then the body will begin this process. Okay. You know, mm -hmm. Dr. Smith writes that recycle senescence parts of cells or senescent cells themselves. That's, what That's better right. said. Yep. <laughs> yeah, okay. we have oxytocin and metalum blue. Both of them are very powerful in inducing autophagy, especially metalum blue do combine with the spike protein and complex it. And um, it also helps to um, tag the amyloids and tag and preventing the spike protein from becoming prions or prions. Um, so methylene blue is a good one to stimulate autophagy and detoxing the spike protein. Oxytocin also induces um, autophagy of the senescent cells. Uh, I think we have these two ingredients. I think there are the top ones currently. That's what I see from, I don't know, Dr. Mike Beamer. The big one, the big one is resveratrol. That's the most potent one, they said. Uh, metformin is, is one that you could possibly consider. Uh, uh, ivermectin has a pro autophagy effects, spermidine and resveratrol. And then of course they give a list of foods uh, that are high in those. And then, uh, and then as you suggest, we, we have confirmed that methylene blue does that. I don't know about, I haven't seen any literature on, on oxytocin uh, in that. So, yeah. And, 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 oh, here's another thing that was really weird. Don't have your long COVID patients exercise. It actually makes all their problems worse. And uh, that's something that kind of flies counter to what you might think. Uh, but they've shown that because of all the mitochondrial dysfunction and chronic inflammation, that you know, uh, 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 much exercise at all, other than kind of normal activities of living or whatever, maybe going to work at a, a low impact job. Uh, but you know, any kind of hard work uh, really start, uh, is a negative. Uh, in the chat, Dr. Southern writes fisetin. Did I pronounce that right? Supplement induces cell autophagy and quercetin. Yeah, quercetin is is on the list uh, as well. It it has a couple pros and cons with it. There was other one, um, luteolin, was another one, but where you, that's harder to find. And and I'm sure there's other herbs and things, and especially if we get into uh, Ayurvedic medicine and. Uh, you know, uh, Asian medicine that you'll find uh, many herbs probably do this that we don't commonly, you know, use or have available to us. But but those are kind of the top of the list. Yeah. So so all those ones that you mentioned. So those of you who were on last night uh, with Dr. Halasa's group that I gave my uh, uh, the new face of uh, weight loss, and we talked about some of the newer things that we're using. And uh, one of the one of the things we're we're, we're using is the AMPK pathway. Uh, which is you know the, the metabolic pathway and all of those all of those supplements that you mentioned resveratrol, um, the TCDs, metformin, um, quercetin are all um, you know stimulate the AMPK or metabolic you know all the metabolic pathways and we're using the, those combinations and there's two supplements that that we use we get from actually we get it from uh, uh, get it from our supply house. Uh, Ecologics, yeah, and that ties Emerson back. Ecologics, and it, it's it's one's called AMPK Activator, and it, you can get it from uh, Life Extension. The other one is a, a liquid from Quicksilver, um, and but all of those all those supplements are contained in in the, in the AMPK. So so there seems to be some sort of synergy there. Does um, that's why I was just going to say that ties in nicely, and you can see why, right? Weight mm -hmm. loss. I mean, we don't want to give a MCB twelve shot lipotrophics. We're trying to. Make sure we don't run out of uh, raw ingredients to, to uh, evacuate the fat. And same story here, right? Weight loss ties right in with autophagy because where does that stuff go? Well, the same place. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah. And um, just to your other your thing. So th there's a combination that's called NeuroProtect, N-E-U-R-P-R-O-T-E-K. You can get it from Amazon. It's about 39 bucks a month. And it's a combination of rudin, luteolin, and quercetin. Um, yep. we, we use that for our, our autistic kids um, who have, you know, inflammatory uh, marker issues. So um, the um, notion kind of, of, kind of easy uh, to use. the notion of athletic people are high risk, especially if they have the post COVID-19 um, and, and uh, too much of exercising like athletic people, there's the sudden death that you hear about them and they are attributing it to uh, post COVID-19. And the reason the spike protein um, uh, alter the angiotensin system and um, activate, overactivate angiotensin type 1, which leads to sympathetic overactivity. So their sympathetic tone is very high for those people with post-COVID-19 syndrome. Uh, 
or, or lingering. And when you, they do the exercise, the sympathetic goes up more and that trigger arrhythmia in the heart and that leads to the sudden um, death. And that's the reason they say, you know, don't do too much of ex extra um, exercising activities so you don't get your sympathetic um, too much high because you have the ready, the base, it's, it's high already from, from the effect of the spike on the angiotensin system, which relates to the sympathetic. And yeah. that's the reason I think oxytocin will play a very good role because it will stimulate the parasympathetic part, will negate, negate the sympathetic part. So I think I can see that uh, oxytocin is the, um, uh, the golden key drug for managing post-COVID-19 for just that specific mechanism. But of course, again, Dr. Mike Beamer, if, I, if you, send, if I, if you uh, look through what I sent to you, uh, oxytocin does it stimulate the AMPK pathway for autophagy. Same like like others, um, and it, it's also they are explaining the reason why exercise do help to um, kill cancer. Part of it it's because exercise increasing oxytocin. Oxytocin has uh, anti-cancer effect, um, especially with breast cancer. So, we, if you start reading about it, you will see there's a lot of good news about it. Especially its natural products. Um, uh, that uh, now the question is, though, Doctor uh, William here. Can you replace oxytocin and instead of giving testosterone, which you're giving your, to your patients, mm -hmm. can testosterone, can oxytocin um, intranasal will help to decrease the amount of testosterone you're giving and possibly don't need to give them, especially for people who does not need an extra testosterone. They already have it, but just an extra boost. But if that's the case, that would be great too, if oxytocin can replace, because we know oxytocin stimulate the lighting cells in the testes to produce or testosterone, but it's not that much. Um, maybe 25% like HGC, but I wanna see if your patients can be weaned from testosterone and be replaced with oxytocin. It will be a good, um, um, something that we can add. You won't get the athletes to do that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, put on, I put on the, in the, on the screen here, this is the, the first line therapy, the long COVID from uh, FLCC. Yeah. And um, I, I probably have about 10 patients um, and we, we do pretty much this, uh, this protocol here. We've had really good success with it. I mean, we, a lot of them um, do a lot better uh, fairly quickly within three to four weeks. Um, I, I'm convinced that the low dose naltrexone um, is a big part of that. Um, and, and again, you, Mike, as you know, we, we get the ivermectin from you. We get the, the one, one dose a day lozenge, you know, we, we figure out yeah. the way. Um, and um, said so, uh, you know, vitamin D, uh, we usually try to get it to between 50 and 80. That's our goal, usually in the mid 60s. Um, uh, the the omega-3 fatty acids, if, if I remember, it was D, the DHA, the DHA portion is, is the most important. Is that? They did discuss I have, that. I have that right. Yeah. Well, they're debating it a little bit, but currently I think you, I think the current consensus is that you're probably right, but they're not totally sure, but the other stuff does work but they don't mm -hmm. know if, if, if for sure, but they're theorizing and there's reasons to theorize that the other's better. And there is also some preliminary evidence of it, but they're, they're a little bit on the fence, but they're leaning that way. Yeah. And, and I have used actually higher doses of prednisone. I've actually started at 60, um, and yep. used 60 milligrams for uh, seven days and then decreased it to 40 and then decreased it to 20. So uh, that's, 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 um, that's what I've been doing. So um so it's, mm -hmm. it's a little higher doses than what they have here. Um, but um, uh, again, intermittent fasting, I uh, don't know how, how um, uh, cooperative our, our patients are. Um, yeah, they have an interesting um, concept of what that is that isn't what I heard before. Um, you know, what I heard before, like when, well, you and I were at A4M last year and we heard the thing on, on all that. And it seemed like intermittent fasting was really powerful, but you know, they were doing it for like several days in a row. And, you know, it was like a pretty intensive thing. Like you do once a month for like two or three or four days. Mm -hmm. And what this is, if you, uh, what FLCCC has done is more like limited your food intake to a smaller and smaller window of the day. Um, and then also interspersing with that intermittent days of complete fasting. Uh, but then they say, but then you can have a snack. So I don't know what that means, right? So I don't know uh, what they've cooked up there, but I, 
look into it more because I, you know, I, I'm sure they have data. I mean, these guys don't do anything with like a gigantic mountain of data behind it, but mm -hmm. it should be in that document that you're looking at where they talk about what is intermittent fasting. And, uh, you know, I, I wanted to look at it further too, because it looked different than what I've seen before, but much more doable. It looked like something I could do, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the rest of it, um, I've used fluvoxamine once. Seem to be okay. Um, IV vitamin C, we do do that. Um, I use the AMPK um, as, as again as a, as our, our sort of uh, energy optimizer. PQQ, you get PQQ with coenzyme Q10 as a combination. Um, and N acetylcysteine, I use it at eighteen hundred milligrams a day. So wow. I, I use use yeah a little bit higher doses. Um, Mm -hmm. We've done, our patients have done really well. Um, I don't know any anyone who who hasn't at least improved, um, and I've never gotten it down into uh, you know the, this Maravox or Verox. I haven't had anybody have that yet. So yeah. So um, and uh, anybody, if anybody else has any experience with these, uh, you know, we, we like to know. Um, and uh, you know, maybe we can have somebody do a uh, a, a, an hour or so uh, in the future on, uh, you know, some of these, um, some of these remedies. Like I said, I have, I have about 10 patients. I don't see a whole lot. I see a few of them. Um, and and uh, uh, we've, we, we, we've been relative, pretty much right down the line, as you see it here. Um, and uh, uh, I've not had to go to hydroxychloroquine. I said, I have one patient on fluvoxamine for any, for depression. We do do some IV vitamin C. So uh, anybody else has any experience with it, uh, Mike? Well, I can tell you, we've done probably, well, thousands of patients and they're, um, yeah, it works very, very well. We have very few problems. Um, I, I'm not really in this latest kind of burst or repopularization of, of, uh, of, of low dose naltrexone use. I've actually had a lot less side effect, like patients directly calling us about side effects. So mm -hmm. I think the medical education has done a really good job of getting out the proper way to um, titrate the dosage up and that doctors are, you know, mm -hmm. doing as quickly as possible, but uh, with, with the uh, proper amount of prudence and caution. So I think that's really positive that that word's gotten out. Um, I, I'm seeing people use an ivermectin for more stuff. Uh, but, you know, like you say, the post-COVID therapy it ties over into all these other medical problems too that patients have, you know. Um, but the big complaint I think is what to do about mitochondrial dysfunction and the brain fog. I mean, I know the other medical problems are out there, but the brain fog seems to be the really, um, well, the one that concerns the most patients and maybe, you know, result is harder to resolve. Um, whereas, you know, I don't know if they discover problems uh, you know, in your, in your immune system or whatever, that all those things have to be taken care of, you know, kind of more slowly. But the one the patients complain about the most is to, to me, us is brain fog. They're like, any, any, re any recommendations there? <clears throat> Personally, I think NAD is really important. Mm -hmm. Ethylene blue is really important. Um, I think the low dose naltrexone, as you described, I know all, you know, your patients describe doing very well on it. Uh, as do others. Um, so I think there is a good consensus on that. I think people are a little funky about it. Like, I believe there's a selling aspect on the doctor's part on the front end, because, you know, people are like, well, they look it up. And they're like, um, I'm not on any drugs, doc, you know, or whatever. And they, they get a little bit like a little bit of concern with the patients about, you know, the idea of what it does because it's hard for them to understand it. But um, once you get past that, people are bought into it and they really want the help and they're praying it's going to work. Yeah. And, um, you know, no, we see all good results and I've really not had any problems uh, reported to me lately at all. Yeah. So, I mean, so we use a lot of LDN, you know, for lots of different things. Mm -hmm. It, it yep. takes five minutes to explain naltrexone, low dose naltrexone. It really isn't that, uh, that, that big a, 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 a haul. When they have nope, here... Nope. Um, I usually give make it 1.5 milligram uh, tablets, and I would make it into a tablet. The tablets seem to have much less side effects than the capsules, so we have them, have them compounded into a tablet. And I, I give them 1.5 milligrams uh, for seven nights, and then 
uh, have it's one 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 pill. The next seven nights, two pills. That's three milligrams. The third week, four point five milligrams. If they're able to tolerate it, then um, we can make it into a four point five milligram pill. Most of the long COVID people are able to take the four point five milligram, but without any problem. Um, and just real quick, the side effects. The big side effects are. Um, uh, so we like to dose it at bedtime. So so by the time the the medication wears off, um, your um, your um, you know your endorphins, uh, the endorphin release is 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 maximized as they wake up in the morning. Um, but about ten percent of the patients um, get a, a sort of a rebound insomnia. You'll know it in the first night or two. Um, then we back off to and we dose it at six p.m. If they still can't sleep, then we do it in the morning. Um, uh, second side effect is nausea. Um, the books say it's up to 32% of the patients. I don't really see it that often, maybe 10%. And I just a handful um, and have, can't take it, you know, can't take the medication because of nausea. It usually goes away in a few days. And then lastly, uh, again, the book and patients do complain. Some, some of them, we tell them, the books call it vivid dreams uh, or nightmares. Um, so we do see them. Those are the major side effects with LDN. Um, about 20% of the patients end up with nightmares. And again, it, a lot of times it, it'll wear off. It does take a couple of months to take, take an effect because we're usually treating chronic diseases with it. Um, and um, it, the, the effect for low-dose naltrexone is uh, twofold. It's, it, it, it increases um, endorphins and it has a, a potent um, cyto, cytokine, um, uh, anti-cytokine um, profile. Um, uh, it, it, Pretty much almost every cytokine it has activities against, except ILs four and ten, uh, which are the um, anti-inflammatory cytokines. It seems to boost them, so that's the reason it has such a you know, broad appeal. I'm, I'm wondering if Dr. Mike Beamer will will, and there is already being done, and it's very effective. There's an FDA approval for that, which is naltrexone intranasal. Maybe that will minimize the side effects of nausea. You get rid from it, and we can list, use this dose there. Um, so this is something you can do. It's already a drug that's FDA approved. That that's that's not hard to do. Naltrexone dissolves in you know water, so no problem. Okay, All including right. nat nat and, and intranasal as well. So you know you can yeah, patients you can take it right. Those two things, if you can do them, then we okay. have a big lecture on them. Okay. Well, I've, got, I've got a presentation in the works and. Uh, on uh, on uh, intranasal drug delivery as a delivery system, and we're going to delve do a deep dive into that uh, coming up. So we'll have that eventually. Right, I'm, I'm promoting you. Okay, and then there's a question about IV no ozone for brain fog. I don't know anything about it. So IV ozone for what? Brain fog. Oh no. Um, no, I mean it was a question. I yeah, I mean they are doing hyperbaric oxygen. Oxygen. Mm -hmm. So I, I mean, I think it's it's not a first line treatment, but but um, but you know, I I mean, it's not without any rationale. Probably if it's oxygenation, but um, you know, might reduce inflammation or something like that. And they and they have found hyper. I would compare it to maybe hyperbaric op, uh, uh, hyperbaric uh, oxygen, or hyperbaric uh, chamber with oxygen. And they found by the way. The hyperbaric chamber doesn't help brain fog and long COVID if you don't use oxygen, and if you don't have some pressure. They're like it's a like I think it's two point four atmospheres it has to be, but uh, they did mention that that was important. And our Dr. Smith uh, says fat fasting helps brain brain fog. So yeah, because it was too so probably right. Okay. Okay. Any anything else? What well, I was a, a quick little. Uh... Mike, you got anything else? No, not really. I'm glad I could give an update. Thank you. That was yeah. a little off. Okay. Ad hoc yeah. little, 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 just off the top of our heads here. Why um, not? Who needs I'm glad to everybody. I'm glad everybody stuck around. Um, I hope you enjoyed Dr. Uh, Dr. Evans' presentation. Um, Dr. Hartman will be next week. Uh, he's going to talk to us about off-label um, uh, therapies for uh, prostate issues. So. Oh, great. Okay. So I can't wait. Same, cool stuff. Same time, same station. We'll see you next week. Bring a friend, just one. Dr. Burgess, take care. Thank uh, you. And um, we'll be in touch. And uh, if anybody's going to AMMG in Denver, uh, October 27th to 30th, make sure you, you let me know you're there um, so we can pal around. Okay.
Yeah, so, yeah. I'll be I'm on Friday morning, uh, the 28th at 11 15. So not too early. Okay. Uh, All right. All right. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, I'm going to uh, sign off and